Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker. Negro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Monday, May 4th, 2020. Uh, May the 4th. Get it? Everybody remembers it's Star Wars Day, and uh, I love going the opposite direction, as I did in the morning post. Uh, we are live and ready for another show, despite the fact that we didn't give just as any real signal that we were, in fact, ready to go. Uh, I missed my ordinary fade out of my pre-show, pre-show music to let everybody know that I was, like, alive and ready to broadcast. But, uh, okay, we're started here on time nonetheless, so uh, you won't notice any difference, I don't think. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know what goes out over the uh, stream and what doesn't. I I don't know anything about this show, to be honest, quite frankly. Uh, I was distracted just for a moment, noticing the fact as I was checking the worldometers this morning um, and uh, taking note of the fact, at least mentally, that we'll be passing, in all likelihood, passing the 70,000 total deaths mark, at least in the official count. I know every time I point these things out, people say, well, you know, unofficially because of this, that, and the other thing. And they're all correct. I assume we are, in fact, well past 100,000 COVID-related deaths at the very least. But I'm going with the numbers that we've got and that I've been uh, benchmarking with all along just to see how fast this thing is moving. But I noticed today um, that one, one thing that we're not really keeping that much track of, we made a big deal out of passing 1 million total cases of COVID-19 in the United States. I'm not certain we've talked a great deal about just how much more that appears to be than the rest of the world. Uh, the next leading country, I suppose, uh, the way you would put it in, in, in Trump sort of terms, is Spain, currently sitting at 247,122 cases. We are at 1,189,024 uh, cases. You know, who knows how closely that hues to actuality and what kind of lag there is, et cetera, et cetera. But I assume if we're lagging, Spain's also lagging. So, okay, relative to Spain and the rest of the world, that's kind of how we're doing. And there are only two other countries in the world with more than 200,000 cases. Everyone else has fewer than 200,000. <clears> There's no other country, as a matter of fact, has reached a quarter million we have a full million and are heading to one and a quarter million this week. I just thought that was kind of interesting. We're not talking about how much more infected we really are. And now, of course, you know, we're a larger country, et cetera. But uh, honestly, to be that far ahead, I mean, there are other large countries that aren't anywhere near us. Um, the UK is the uh, sitting in the fourth spot, uh, largely probably due to their initial uh, non-reaction to the virus reaching them just the way we did, although they're a smaller country. They have 186,599 cases, which means that we have added an entire UK's epidemic to our total just since we reached a million cases on April 27th. And what is today? So it's May the 4th, right? So May, May the 4th, etc. blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's say four days, three more days in April 7th. So one week. In one week, we've added the entire UK's uh, entire stock of infections on top of the million we already had. <clears throat> We're really not doing all that well with this, uh, this pandemic. Of course, uh, President Trump put on a performance of sorts yesterday. I guess he decided to have what he was calling a town hall meeting. I, I, I gather from what little I have seen of it that he was taking calls from people via some sort of remote setup, just like we're doing, as a matter of fact, with Greg Dwork, and we're taking our remote calls from him as well, except I'm not at the Lincoln Memorial. I don't know why he chose that. I guess he thought there would be these dramatic pictures of him in juxtaposition to Lincoln, but in what he got, television visual-wise, uh, from what I was able to tell, I'm sure they zoomed in closer to him while he was talking, but a couple of 
pre-show stills that were distributed of him looking absolutely microscopic sitting at the feet of Abraham Lincoln, which was kind of belittling, I, I think, but I guess he thought it was a great visual and maybe he had Martin Luther King's speech on the, in front of the memorial in mind. And in this one, of course, the area had to be deserted and you're not allowed to get within six feet of anybody else and yada yada. So it didn't, I don't know how well it came across, but uh, you know, he did the thing where he praised himself as being the most fantastic guy ever. And uh, the journalists did the thing where they say, whatever you say, sir. And uh, I'm not certain what came of it. Maybe Greg has a better idea. Maybe not. I don't know. Could be all about Star Wars. Probably lots about coronavirus and none about the president except to say he's unable to do anything. And uh, everybody who they ask, how do you like him, says he sucks. So let's find out. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Hi. Well, that's really the the most important part. Yeah. If you I ask people, so. they say he sucks. Yeah, well. I mean, you that know, is say? actually true. Well, they, it's true that he sucks, say, and it's true that people say right. that. Yeah, so we have double truth going on here. So that, eh, that's a good way to start a Monday. Yeah, so we're going to actually go over that a little bit. But I, I did want to give you, since you brought it up, uh, Jake Sherman's tweets hmm. about uh, the Lincoln Memorial thing, okay. uh, which is always interesting. <clears throat> I mean, the, the problem is that little people look small no matter where they're at. But if you're going to be next to like a really big person, like a giant statue of yeah. Lincoln, and then compare yourself to Lincoln... And oh, say that Lincoln yes, right. had it a lot harder than you, <laughs> However, um, you did. which he did. <clears throat> well, he uh, said he was treated I don't know worse. How well, it's going to go over. I've been treated worse than Lincoln, and I, yeah, he said that's a couple times he said that one, and so there's no correcting him on that one. I think they should be treated exactly. He's probably alike. talking about Lincoln in 1917. That could be. I mean, yeah, because he's know. always talking about the pandemic of 1917 that didn't exist till <laughs> yeah, a year which, later, which stopped the war. Yeah, yeah. What stopped the war Civil is America war. getting into it, but you know, whatever. Yeah, that happened in 1917, so maybe he's confusing two things. The movie is called 1917, and that's all that he knows about. While Biden is relegated to his basement in Delaware, says Jake Sherman from Politico, <laughs> Tiger Beat on the Potomac, Trump held a virtual town hall on Fox News on Sunday night at the Lincoln Memorial, an imposing and dramatic background that was the most vivid illustration of the logistical advantages afforded to an incumbent president. Which is okay. true. He does have yeah, a I mean, logistical yeah. advantage. If he says something, people follow it. The, the cable news plays it all the time. The problem oh, yeah. for him is the more you see of him, the less people like him, which we'll go over in detail. But the big news, says Jake Sherman, Trump said during a two-hour-long event that he was very confident there would be a vaccine by the end of the year. Also, Trump stakes are good. Uh, what else did he say? If you can get a good education at Trump University, why he says stuff and then people believe what? him, I just have no idea. I have no idea why reporters take him seriously. He lies about absolutely everything. It's proven. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. But he said that. A much quicker timeline than public health experts expect. And while he was doing this, of course, uh, Debbie Burks was on uh, Fox News saying his numbers are all wrong about how many people are going to die. And the uh, people who are protesting are idiots. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm good. Good for her. Maybe. Right. Uh, red line alert. Trump said the administration is not doing anything legislatively without a payroll tax cut, uh -huh. which I think is one of those ideologic. This is what you're supposed to do when things are bad, even if you don't cut. have a job, because if you don't have a job, you don't have a payroll to cut. Right. This is in addition to Senate Republicans demand that Democrats agree to limiting liability for businesses in the post coronavirus world. Basically, these demands are coming from the fact that Republicans are now aware. I mean, I use a word like uh, cognizant, but I don't want to well, make Trump not understand things with big words. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, but they're becoming aware that what they're doing in Congress is not impressing voters. There are a couple of stories about that over the weekend. Republicans concerned, miffed, whatever. You know, they look at their polling and Democrats are getting all the credit for this for uh, some reason. For what? For whatever Congress does. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. Right? It's. I mean, Democrats are the ones that wanted to pass legislation that. giving money to people, and Republicans keep putting these impositions on them to the point where Democrats say, I can't even talk to you, Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. Let me just talk to the White House, and we'll figure it out. So the White House and uh, the uh, Democratic House have figured out how to deal with the four things that have already been done. Yeah. And uh, the Senate's been completely excluded, and they're mad about it. 
So now they want to put all these other demands to say, you have to negotiate with us. Well, I don't know that you do, really, because hmm. the okay. voters don't really think so. Uh, all right. Well, uh, I, yeah, who knows? I can't even tell you. They're, they've been gone and uh, only now are returning to Washington. The Senate is returning. Uh, House I mean, McConnell's only week. response has been screw the blue states. Yeah. And that didn't go over so well either. I mean, he really is playing a bad hand badly. So, yeah. you know, uh, so. the Senate is now in play. Uh, who says so? Stu Rothenberg and, and uh, Josh Krauschauer. And, you know, it's look, let me let me give you this one. Uh, this is from National Journal, but it's uh, uh, freed up from the paywall. It's true anyway. Okay. Josh Grash, our endangered Republicans keeping distance from Trump. As the president's numbers slip, Republicans are recalibrating their strategy for winning in tough times. Hmm. Now, if they actually went out and legislated and did stuff, that would help. But that's they, they can't conceive of that. That would be governance, and they don't know how to do that. So here's some staples of the GOP's pre-pandemic thinking. Republicans should embrace the president at all costs, even in swing states where his job approval is underwater. It's more important to rally the base than persuade swing suburbanites. And with Republicans defending most of their Senate seats in Trump territory, holding the president's voters would be adequate to maintain Mitch McConnell's majority. Mm. Uh, here's what I'm hearing now, says Josh Krauschauer. Republicans should be talking about their work to help their communities in the wake of the pandemic and revoid referencing Trump's role in managing the crisis. That's actually a memo that leaked out to win battleground Senate seats that are looking more tenuous. It will be crucial to maintain support from some Trump skeptical independents. Really? Are you are you saying that the base isn't enough to win? What a Hmm. concept. I wonder how they came up with that. I don't know. That sounds like uh, something we ought to cover. Yeah, we really ought to. If Trump's political condition doesn't improve by the fall, prepare to talk about keeping the Senate as a check against Democratic power, even if it means acknowledging the presidency is likely lost. Hmm. The Republican argument could pivot to this. If you don't like Trump, you also don't want to give Democrats the keys to the kingdom. You got to put a check on Biden, said former Republican Representative Tom Davis. You can't let them control everything. That's a good argument for independent okay. voters. Yeah. Which tells you what's going on here. A new slate of reputable red state polls released this week will raise further alarm at the White House, where the president's already been fuming over his declining numbers. A survey commissioned by Georgia House Republicans painted a grim picture across the state for the entire party. Trump led Biden by only one point. This is another one where Biden is either winning by a point or tied in Texas. That doesn't mean he's going to win Texas or Georgia, folks. But if Trump has to play defense in those states, he's lost. Okay. Let's get to it. Funny thing is Biden could win those states. That would be really funny. Oh. But, oh, right. you know, we don't know. Biden led Trump by 15 points among independent voters in the state and by a whopping 43 points among moderates. Mm. And equally worrisome for Republicans are signs that Trump's problems are affecting down-ballot GOP candidates. Oh, my goodness. If it affects them, this might be something they actually have to pay attention to. Yes, or we would eliminate them. I suppose right. that would take either one. So you have the, the have odd second. situation. Yeah. where uh, Republicans may be forced to do the right thing because, dare I say it, the voting public wants them to. Hmm. Isn't that a concept, too? Yeah, I don't know. if uh, we Do we still do that? I don't know. I, I don't know if we've gone that far, but, you know, that's the it's direction all crazy. this is going. Harry Enten uh, uh, tweeted over the weekend, the state polling the last two weeks from pollsters I trust has been clear. Biden's ahead in the states he needs to win. And if this were the polling on election day, he'd be in strong shape. This is where I say we have six months to go. That's where everybody's going to add. And rightly so. We do have six months to go. That but he's losing. Right Trump on. is losing. Trump campaign pollster Fabrizio Lee and Associates finds registered voter support sending every voter an absentee ballot application 64 to 27. And Ron Brownstein had previously noted that in the swing states, the important ones, including Ohio, uh, moving to vote by mail is a thing. So uh, that makes it less easy for Republicans to screw with the results. Um, It's a given that they're going to try. It's not a given they're going to succeed. Yes. Uh, Well, certainly their their normal uh, screw with the vote technique of suppressing uh, turnout is is problematic. I I, I don't know whether this just affords them new opportunities to screw with the vote. Different, differently cast in different ways. I well, they're not so. that smart, and it's really hard when you have to make these last-minute adjustments. It's one thing to plan for ah, 10 okay. years yeah, to yeah, slowly yeah. and methodically get to a you. place where you can do this, and it's quite another to reduplicate everything. They're not usually nimble. In uh, six weeks. So you know, it just doesn't work that way. All right. Well, good. 
They could kill the post office between now and then, but we'll find out. Well, you know, that's part of what they're trying, but some of it is just so obvious and ham handed that it doesn't fly. Here's what we learned looking at every state-level poll conducted in April, said 538. This is Perry Bacon. Several polling firms released surveys of Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin in April. Former President Barack Obama carried all four states in 2012. Trump flipped all four in 2016, as well as in Ohio and Iowa, neither of which has met much recent polling. Uh, in an Iowa poll, Biden was competitive. And Biden... Appears to lead in all four now. North Carolina, which has gone Republican, was also polled pretty often in April, with Trump and Biden looking pretty basically tied there. There was a recent poll of North Carolina showing Biden with a big lead, but they didn't wait for education. So you can almost say it doesn't count. Nonetheless, Uh, uh, these are all good numbers for Biden. So uh, uh, here's a really interesting one, I thought. And this I especially like uh, to follow because it's PRRI. And they look at evangelicals, they look at uh, religious uh, affiliation vote, including what they call the nuns, that is to say, no affiliation. Right. Got to remember them. President Trump's favorability ratings recede from March peak, largest declines in favorability among Trump-based groups. Trump's favorability declined by six points between March and April from 49 to 43. The decline was not uniform among demographics, and the largest declines were among some of Trump's key base groups. We'll get back to that concept in a minute. Those include white Christian groups, specifically white mainline Protestants, minus 18, uh, compared to where he was in March, white Catholics, minus 12, and white evangelical Protestants, minus 11. Large declines are also evident among those living in battleground states, minus 15, those age 65 and over, the new soccer moms, minus 14, while Americans without a college degree, minus 12, and white women, minus nine. So uh, the point there is several fold. First of all, Trump's base isn't big enough to win. Number two, everybody says, LOL, nothing matters. You can never move his base. For the most part, that's true. But on the margins, you can. And if you lose 10 percent of your base, you're screwed. Hmm. Yes. And uh, killing them off is one way to do that. Hmm. So if you have a rural area, let's say in Georgia, yeah, uh, that has we an explosion one. of uh, coronavirus, and you're really doing a bad job in controlling it, and you get the impression that Republicans only care about getting themselves reelected, hmm. uh, that is not good for Trump amongst his base. That's true in Iowa. That's true in uh, South Dakota. And uh, you know what's what's fascinating, of course is, uh, you know, I, I tweeted over the weekend one of those old Burma shave things. Mm-hmm. You know, the mistakes you make opening in in uh, today are going to be seen at the end of May. <laughs> Burma shave, you know. Right. The, 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 the idea is that there's this lag between when you posture and beat your chest about, look how I am controlling the agenda and I am going to declare that this stuff is going to happen and I'm going to rally my base around this really stupid idea and I'm going to show the media and pollsters how I can get my base to listen to me. Yes. And you get to do that for a couple of weeks and then all of a sudden the case uh, count goes up and you don't look so smart. And so, you know, that's what's coming and that's why his advisors are starting to get a little nervous. I think one of them had said this remarkable thing to the Washington Post all these scientists with the God complex, science, 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 when they should be maybe paying more attention to politics. Mm -hmm. As if helping people isn't good politics. As Ah, if doing the right thing Mm -hmm. with the science so that you kill less people isn't good politics. It's remarkable how stupid people in the White House are. That was probably a Jared quote. Well, could be, because that's the way he thinks. And so, you know, what Trump is doing is just... To, to put it uh, as simply as possible, it's not helping him. Hmm. So now he goes and he promises that there's going to be a vaccine by the end of Jan- <laughs> uh, you know by the end of uh, December, beginning of January. And the oh, uh, the crash course that people are doing in industry to get this done is remarkable and amazing. But that doesn't mean that you can speed up safety testing. And again, I go back to 1976 and swine flu, at least the scare of it. And Gerald Ford pushing through too fast uh, a whole vaccination program, which turned out that the vaccine was linked to Guillain-Barre, which is a rare neurologic condition that uh, uh, is is a very difficult and can be fatal situation. Hmm. And so the swine flu thing didn't happen, but Guillain-Barre did. And uh, it's basically uh, somebody who only listened to some people but didn't want to listen to other people and push things through a little bit 
too fast without safety vetting. Uh, so we have, and, and that was small scale. So uh, this would be very large scale. We have some cautionary uh, tales about doing that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's remarkable what people can do when everybody's working together to get stuff done and, and uh, you know, uh, training the sites on the science. Uh, we saw it with polio back in the 50s. And uh, we're seeing it now with coronavirus, and that part's wonderful. That's the best of American ingenuity and business. Hmm. And the worst part is over-promising and trying to sell this stuff as if it's Trump's stakes because he doesn't really care about the result. He just wants to get the news cycle for today off his back yes. because everybody keeps remembering in February you didn't do anything, and that's why we are where we are, and he doesn't want to take responsibility for that. Right. He takes no responsibility and, whatsoever. Hence right? a long, uh, detailed discussion about <clears throat> what happened at the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> Okay. What happened at the Lincoln Memorial is Trump got the it. podium that he can command because he's president. And he said, we're going to have a vaccine in January. Stop paying any attention to anything that happened prior to this moment or uh, that's going to happen in the next 15 minutes. Just look at me right now and let me sell you a vaccine. Yeah. Well, apparently I worked with the, the Axios and uh, Politico crowd. Well, was, everything works with them. Yeah, that got Yes. You know, the thing is that nothing works the with the public. It. it doesn't move the public. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, my first reaction to reading about that this this morning, I, hey, Trump says we're going to have a vaccine by this time. And then, oh, well, I, I guess we're not going to have a vaccine then. Uh, so that pretty much answers the question for me. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't know. For some reason, there's a there's a faction of the press that just loves to print the wrong thing over and over again and doesn't realize what's happening to them and i don't know maybe they just don't care about their credibility it doesn't matter or whatever you sell papers you sell them that day you, you know and and of course uh, to find out whether or not they were wrong you got to buy the next day's paper for the correction so maybe it's a good business model right uh but i don't think so yeah i mean i hope it isn't okay blah that was awful <laughs> I mean, but you know, it's it's a uh, it's a summary of, of where we're at, and well, I, I mean, think that's that, your uh, job. Uh, that's important to there's the uh, vaccine to go over. I'll get it. Hello. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's what should we talk about in the next uh, three or four minutes before we do this? Let's talk about the Joe Biden um, uh, uh, allegations. Ah. Yes. About impropriety collapsing we have not over the weekend. To date, uh, it, which has been a real pleasure, by the way, <laughs> not talking about it. But uh, we didn't. Uh, there wasn't enough to add to what was being printed to say anything. But yeah, I, I know a lot of people probably felt like we skipped it. Yes, let's. Well, talk. There, there's there's two allegations. Yes. Uh, yeah. Or right. at least one of them lasted about fifteen minutes. Yeah, the latest one is easier to talk about because it fell apart much faster. Right. Uh, but basically. Mm -hmm. uh what do you remember uh o'donnell christine the, o'donnell the, i'm yes. i'm a witch person who I'm ran against a biden for senate see that's her problem we all remember it the other way yes right uh yeah so uh now she claims that a relative uh who was in her teens 14 uh 14 exactly uh, right Biden made disparaging remarks about uh her uh, physical build and so on and so forth tweeted by an ABC reporter who then had to retract it because it turns out that the uh, gridiron dinner that this supposedly took place at, mm -hmm. uh, Biden actually wasn't physically present and gave one of those video talks. Yeah. And then she said, well, OK, maybe it didn't happen there. Maybe it happened a year before that, where yeah. she would have still been 14, I suppose. Yeah, she's been 14 for you know, a long time. Uh, as long Six, as Jack Benny's years. been 39. Right. But, you know, the, the, the thing is that <laughs> Biden wasn't at that one either. Yeah. And so they had to retract everything and, and then say, hey, one. you know, it's really weird. But this is being these charges are being made by a Republican partisan who ran against him. Yeah. Who was out on the fringe anyway. And That's maybe we rich. shouldn't be uh, blasting this all over Twitter and social media. So it sort of disappeared, you know, within an hour of it going up. That was the second one. Mm -hmm. The first one. um, it, it remains a difficult and delicate situation in the sense that one does not wish to disparage people who bring charges. Everybody should be, uh, you know, taken seriously. And of course, those charges should be vetted. And that's that is the standard. It's always been the standard. 
Uh, you can tell right away whether somebody's serious about this in terms of uh, actually, you know, trying to get to the truth of what's going on mm. very yeah. quickly. And it's yes. in the same sentence that you brought this up. Did you bring up Kavanaugh? Yeah. If, if right. you did, you're playing politics. Uh, yes, I did see somebody mention Forget again. Forget about your whole discussion after yeah. that. that Kavanaugh has so nothing mad. whatsoever to do with this. Still the question is, did Biden do it? Yes Supreme or no? Court. There's many reasons to think he did not. Uh, that will play out over time. David Axelrod had a piece uh, Friday basically saying, I was part of the vetting oh, yeah. Obama for uh, vetting Biden for Obama's uh, VP nomination. Yes, and did, did an incredibly thorough job, unlike the people who are there right now. And there's nothing. Yeah, I mean, that's got to stand as strong testament. You can certainly think they missed something. It's always possible. But they, they did, for, for no drama Obama, they were working very hard. And, and there were right, some that, initial indications that they would find something, not that. But, you know, he had made some weird comments about Obama. So, you know, they raked him over the coals and they they just couldn't find a thing. I'm right. sure they look so, at the you know, I, and everything. My, my own personal view is at this particular point in time, I just don't think he did it, and I don't think she's credible, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how that works yeah. out. Yeah, well, right. And uh, as far as Gump would say, that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, there's not too much more to add to it in a, you know, in, in responsible fashion at the moment. There's plenty, plenty of commentary that is much more vitriolic, no shortage of that, obviously. And uh, you can find a lot of people that will dispute it much more sharply. But yeah, I don't, I don't find it necessary. And uh, well, I, there's, there's more things that have to play out to figure right, out. Right now, it's not convincing the public. Right, the Christine O'Donnell one really astonished me over the weekend, just because I, I was amazed at how certain she was of the day and time. And then it except was like, yeah, maybe it could be and wrong the fact that he wasn't there. But except <laughs> for that, totally, totally sure about it. Yeah, well, she's a real credible source, Christine. Okay. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for K-Girl in the Morning. And I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the K-Girl in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that Kegro in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday. But our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash X gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to patreon.com slash kgrox to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. Welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. And uh, all right, we'll see where we go next. We, we've been debating back and forth. And the answer is... And the answer is, you know, I'm just going to give you a process piece by David Jolly about the Biden papers, just because it's worthy to ah, have okay. some facts, there is you know, more to say. just uh, floating out there. Sure. Uh, David Jolly wrote, Biden's request for the Secretary of the Senate to look for and produce any employee complaints from Tara Reid should be getting more coverage because it's the right and fair move by the vice president. The issue is not the Delaware Papers. When a congressional staff member is hired, Mm -hmm. they're hired as an employee of the House or Senate. So in other words, they work for the institution, not for the individual. Hmm. So where you were in the House, you were working for the House. I guess I was. Whoever you were working for, you were working for the House. Right. Now, what a nice house it was. Right. The tenure is with the institution and under the administration of the clerk of the House or the secretary of the Senate. Mm-hmm. because you can't have a clerk of the Senate or the Secretary of the House because, like, they always do everything different just because they do. It would make sure. it easier for outsiders to understand, which is why they don't do it, I suppose, right? Uh-huh. But the clerk of the House or the Secretary of the Senate, in this case it would be the Secretary of the Senate, and they work in the office of a member, senator, committee, whatever, and they may choose to remain employed with another office when their member or senator leaves, True. So that means that if you're working for somebody, if you're working for uh, Maxine Waters and uh, you decide to work for somebody else. Yeah. 
you you can do that without leaving your employment. Or if somebody retires or gets defeated in an election, you can switch and work for somebody else without leaving your employment. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that's actually true. Uh, or they may choose to separate work. from the Hill. But the exit paperwork, as with all paperwork, is handled by the clerk or secretary's office regarding COBRA, retirement, final pay, you know, all those little messy yeah. details. Okay, so... The, so far, so good, right? And, yeah, so, right, all right, I'll let you... So, so the point is, you're not working for Biden. Yeah. Which is why Biden doesn't have control over this material. When a member or senator leaves... Stuff. Yeah. The House or Senate sends all their office materials in both on-site and in storage to the retiring member or senator's home office or designated destination, you know, self-storage, uh -huh. like a university, yeah. or self-storage, sometimes the same thing. But those <laughs> materials do not include employment records. Employment records remain the custody of the House or Senate because the institution was, is, and remains the employer of all members, senators, and staff members. If records exist of a complaint filed with the Senate, they would not be with Biden's official and personal archives in Delaware, but they would be with the secretary of the Senate under whatever storage protocol administered by that office for employee records. Right. Biden was right to request the secretary of the Senate search for and release any complaints filed with the secretary of Ms. Reed. That's absolutely possibly the right thing to do. Charlie's right here. Uh -huh. Where other politicians seek to hide information, Biden deserves credit for trying to produce it. So. In terms of Biden saying, guys, this is where you should look. I don't think there's anything there, but go at it. That's fine. In regard to the Delaware records that don't have this, what's interesting is mm -hmm. the uh, initial reporter instinct to say, well, if you don't want us to see it, there must be something there. Therefore, we want to see it uh, even more. Yeah. And that was so blatant that it quickly became apparent that they wanted the fishing exposition, uh, expedition. We sure. want to go through Why your papers for 50 years. Something will be there. Yes. I'll get a byline out of it, a story. So there's right. got to be something, something interesting. Else. There. And they're right about all of that. Yeah. And it's completely irrelevant to the discussion at hand oh. in terms of what's going on with the facts. So, well, yes, it's true. It's trick. You would be interested in that. There probably is a story in there, and you can't have it because it's not germane and relevant. Hmm. Yeah, or even if it was, I mean, it's uh, a lot of times the the personal and office records are kept under seal, particularly when people have then gone on to hold national well, office. You know, the, but, these are going to have, you know, remember Trump, you, you can't see my records because yeah, my well, advisors are advising me and it's confidential. Uh, these are all Obama being, uh, confidential stuff. Yeah. Right. The, the idea true too. that Republicans are asking reasons. that it's perfectly OK for everybody to know what's going on here. Send your damn stuff to the house when they ask for it or shut up. Hmm. Yep. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an old tactic uh, to, you know, you, you want to get into confidential. the Your stuff, I the want archives. it out there on the front page. Yeah. I don't see anything wrong with that. That's politics, and that's mm -hmm. fine. But it's politics. Let's be clear about what's going on here. Yeah, well, that would, would help if everybody were clearer about it. But uh, it doesn't help their political point. Oh, very often you want to disguise that it's a political point. But if yeah. you can't, in this case, you can't. No. Well, and then, you know, with uh, Christine O'Donnell piling on, that doesn't help either. Yeah, I, I don't know. The Christine O'Donnell yeah. angle was, was, was quite amazing. Uh, and yeah. it has nothing to do with, I mean, I, I guess the idea was that was supposed to be a corroborating story, like he was inappropriate with this person, so therefore he may have been uh, much more than inappropriate with this other person. That, that was tenuous to begin with, but uh, in addition to which... Yeah, oh, I remember it like it was yesterday, except for what day or year it happened in or who was there. Right. Hmm. So then uh, there's another angle of it here because hmm. Biden is doing the vice presidential search thing. OK. All right. Yes. And he's going to have a panel empowered to check and vet just as he was checked and vetted and they didn't find anything. And uh, one of the members of that panel is Chris Dodd. And okay. there were allegations made against Chris Dodd some 20 years ago. And frankly, I don't even remember what they are, which is part, part of why I'm bringing it up. Yeah. Because, again, Politico and Axios, not, not Axios, but Politico is going with the Chris Dodd casts a shadow on Biden because he's on the panel. What, where, why? They didn't tell uh, us. Are, are you what the only one that actually cares about that? I don't get it. What are you trying to do here? You know, and so uh, the point is, if there's an actual problem it needs to be addressed. I just don't think this is 2016. I don't mm -hmm. think but her emails. I don't think trying to get a different angle 
on the same story when there's nothing there is going to fly. I'm sorry. I don't think oh, it will. Not. We're in the middle of a pandemic, and frankly, there's more serious things going on than yeah. not, well, as a political uh, threat, not, yeah. not necessarily uh, Tara Reid's charge, because all charges have to be taken seriously. But the let's the O'Donnell's and the let's find other stuff to pile on that's tangential and not really. But, you know, it sort of seems like maybe the same thing. And let's just put it all in the same pot and see if we can put it on the front page and see if anybody reads it. You know, I, I just don't think that's going to fly this year. Yeah. Well, I, it depends on who's who's uh, hoping. The base fly. is the base. You know, let them, you know, yeah. they can do whatever they want to do. But the funny thing is uh, uh, Trump has an incredibly huge problem here because if it comes up that uh, you have to take everything seriously and all records should be released, you know, the obvious answer is release yours. Well, no. OK, well, then end the discussion. I mean, oh, it's a political problem for him. He uh, can't just do that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm not. I'm not so certain that you can't just do it. I, but you like. I guess what you're trying well, to do. Well, Donald can do it. You do but it, and it didn't win. work. That's what I yeah. mean. You can't just do it. You can do a lot of stuff. But if it's ineffective, what's the point? I don't know. Uh, well, then, well, that's the Trump White House. They love doing ineffective things and then that's you know true. patting themselves on and the back fine. for how effective they are. I'm I'm all for them doing the most ineffective thing there. I guess the other thing, the other players here are the newspapers. And when we say, well, it won't fly, like, well, what do you mean it won't? fly like it won't work or they won't be able to sell newspapers with won't it be able or... to sell newspapers they'll put it up there and you know some things Man. really are a one or two day story i guess let's see how much we hear about chris dodd for example uh yeah i would like to know what the <laughs> what it was i just just to have my memory let's refreshed. see how long we hear about uh, christine o'donnell i mean some of these are just ephemeral yeah well i don't know she she came back like a bad rash but <laughs> for a moment you know and then gone again <laughs> well that's all she was with us for in the first place. She, I never really expected to hear from her again. That was very interesting. Also, by the way, I was a little fascinated by it. You mentioned that that I, I had forgotten that Christine O'Donnell was, in fact, running against Biden in 2008. So that was the, the year she first pegged it as happening in May of 2008. Uh, uh, Biden Because that was, year is indelible in her mind, right? Well, except you know, it was a big it deal. It wasn't that year and that he wasn't right. there. Except for that, she, she remembers that it. That wasn't like her it was biggest yesterday. year. But uh, 2008, uh, like I remember Christine O'Donnell, she was running against the guy who actually eventually took and kept that seat. Was uh, is that Chris Coons who uh, won that? Yeah. So I remember her running against him, but I forgot that she actually ran against Biden directly in 2008 because Biden was running for both both for re-election to the Senate and vice president simultaneously. Delaware being one of those states. I don't know whether they changed the law right then and there to make that possible. That rings a bell but anyway he was running for both i guess as a backup and she was the republican nominee for senate in 2008 which would have been in november and it leads you to wonder well if you remember clearly like it was yesterday that biden your opponent your direct opponent and by the way also running for vice president on the democratic ticket and you're a republican running for national office I can't believe that that didn't come up like, hey, you shouldn't vote for him for Senate or for vice president because of what he said to my niece, which was so terrible. But I forgot. I. All right. I mean, okay. I, I, I don't I, it, I don't want to fall into the trap of well, why didn't you say something then? Except it didn't happen to her. And maybe she didn't want to embarrass her niece. That's always a possibility. But if you I don't know if you could sink the Democratic who, who was 14 ticket, then and yeah. now. Right, yeah, and then it didn't. Then maybe it was the year before when she wasn't fourteen. When was she weird. was fourteen, right? But I, the whole thing strikes me as rather unbelievable, just based on that. Like you, you had that information about the vice presidential candidate and your direct opponent, and you didn't say anything. Yeah. Look, more information may come out, and people uh, with an open mind can change their minds if more sure. information comes Let's out. But that. right now, the whole thing looks like a hit job to me. Yeah. And also, I guess, you know, you could always also point out, uh, that's not Tara Reid. Okay. All right. That's a different, yeah, it is a different story. Mm. There is that. There is that. So uh, the uh, MSN uh, tracker poll hasn't been updated since uh, Friday. What? Why not? Oh, it was. Ah, it's now terrific. updated as of today, just oh, now. Sleep, approved 39, disapproved 57. So it just that gives you an idea of how yeah. things are going for Trump. So, you know, it's uh, it's one thing to say, well, butter emails 2016, this happened, uh -huh. Electoral College, we're never safe, uh, uh, you know, the national polls mean nothing, this, that, and everything else. And the other side of the coin, of course, is that it's not 2016. 2016 was incredibly volatile when you look at the polling. 
Uh, and this is not, this is pretty steady. These are train track poles, you know, when you look at the graphs and they don't move all that much. Uh, but they also don't move up for Trump all that mm. much. You couldn't even get a bump in the middle of a national disaster. And that national disaster isn't done yet because he's downplaying it. And there's so much more to come. Yes. There was he's a really disaster. interesting article in Vox all right. uh, about the fact that uh, the uh, virus is truly actually hitting uh, counties that voted for Hillary harder than Trump right at the moment. It's by uh, Philip Klinkner, who is a political scientist. Democrats and Republicans have experienced the pandemic in objectively different ways, and those differences are already shaping the nation's pandemic response. Poll after poll after poll shows the more it affects you personally, the more personally and difficult uh, you think this uh, situation is, and the uh, ser more seriously you take the pandemic. Okay. The thing is, with half the country under various and sundry, some well thought out, some not so well thought out, uh, go ahead and open plans. Mm -hmm. That Burma shape thing is true. I mean, when you start to open, you're going to see increases in viral levels. And it's going to take a couple of weeks to see that. So the congratulatory, isn't it wonderful we're doing this now, is going to be replaced in non-Hillary counties. Mm. Uh, with not so good news. And that's just something we have to be prepared for. And that's why Debbie Burks was so upset on Fox about the protesters demanding that uh, we open up too fast and by downplaying the number of deaths. Burks put it at 100 to 240,000 and lies and says, we always said that's what it was. Hmm. Yes. Well, and Trump is saying ah, 50. That. That's what he said at the Lincoln Memorial. 50, maybe 60, you know, yeah. uh, you know, maybe maybe not too many more than that. And then it will all go away. Yeah. And so, you know, hoping that it all goes away is basically his plan, which is not a plan. Right. And that's what he has. That's what he's going with. There isn't going to be anything else. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, also, he's just doing a terrible job kicking the can forward. I don't know if he understands math or or the, the size of the problem he's talking about. But he, every time we pass what he says we're going to have in total. Well, he but I'm saying he's still on this. Let's win people. the moment. You know, let's win the next 10 minutes kind of discussion. It's got that's nothing to do with what's going to happen tonight or tomorrow. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just, to me, I, I, I don't know how it works. I guess maybe for most people it just doesn't. But uh, if you want to win the next 10 minutes, you got to have to kick the can further in your prediction than 10 minutes worth of. Of well, see, death. here's the thing. Okay, from this uh, Vox piece uh, by Philip Klinkner. All right. All right. What is Vox? Can Cl you explain that? Vox Splainer. Yes. Clinton counties make up a slight majority of the U.S. population, but so far they've seen 76% of the COVID-19 cases and 80% of the deaths. By the way, Why? Uh, AEI and Scott Gottlieb and others have pulled out the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut numbers from the, the national numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you look at them separately, the tri-state area is declining and the rest of the country is increasing. Yes. So uh, at the time this article was written, 76% of the coronavirus cases and 80% of the deaths are in Clinton counties. Trump counties are 44% of the population and 24% of the cases and 20% of the deaths. Mm -hmm. That's not going to stay true. Okay. Right. That's It may not explode the way New York did. And there may be a variety of reasons. One reason might be that, uh, you know, again, you may recall from uh, previous days where this was announced and then it gets lost. But Cuomo brought it up again over the weekend, Andrew Cuomo, when he was doing his daily um, uh, press conference. Yeah. The virus in New York came from Europe. The virus in California came from Cal came from China. Hmm. And they may have different virulence. And we don't know who's seeding where with what. True. Uh, and if it turns out that, uh, let's say, Florida had the China virus, no. but uh, other states' uh, meatpacking plants have the yeah. European virus, uh, you know, huh. it, that's one explanation for how come uh, you see these hotspots that you just didn't expect when everybody else seems to be doing okay. Because that's Could not be. really well explained at Although, this point. Is yeah. it a combination of the genetics of the virus, the outdoor versus indoor? Uh, Meatpacking plants in particular, uh, inside, I am told, because mm -hmm. I've never been inside one, and it's been a long time since I read Upton Sinclair. Yeah, most things that get in there are dead. Well, but you use saws and other things yeah. that aerosolize stuff. Imagine if you would just right. a regular old woodworking shop with the sawdust. Yeah. Except now you're talking about bone dust. Yes, and... Uh... 
uh, so viral so the magic. point is that like, you have like all these Muhammad machines that are aerosolizing stuff and then right. if you sneeze into that aerosol that's being produced by the machines and it gets mm-hmm. carried all over the factory yes that's how it might spread uh yeah that's one way it's a it's a dirty business certainly. it's a dirty business I can't and believe so MBS you know it doesn't have it uh but uh, the thing is they're real and these are happening and the idea that somehow or other we've turned the corner and we're no longer, ha- you know, that's not true. Actually, no. cases are increasing. If anything, they've plateaued. But we talked about this last week. It's not a pike speak where it goes up and goes down. It goes up and then it goes down slowly, if at all. And right now it's not even going down. Hmm. So the idea that, OK, now is the perfect time to open. It's just nuts. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's okay. And yet you're not going to see the result of that nutty decision for a couple of weeks. So it's not until the end of May that you're going to see, oh, maybe that was a bad decision. Let's go back and undo it. Mm. If if that's how it registers with you. I mean, two weeks is an awfully long time for a lot of these people. And they'll say, I don't know how this happened. The Chinese must have come and dropped. Exactly. They must have done it again. They they, uh, let it loose in the factory. That's another thing that happened over the weekend. (laughs) Mike Pompeo and uh, the Trump administration are all in. I'm blaming this on a factory release of virus from China. Uh, whoops. All right. Which is a, a bit of a nutty situation. He said, no, 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 no. The intelligence services said so. Well, who's running the intelligence service these days? Yeah. Well, Grinnell? who is? I don't know. Because the guy who used to run it, he's he forgot he's now Secretary of State. And it's well, to but the guy who over. is now running it, uh, who's still the ambassador from Germany, who's still Maybe. a uh, Trump toady and nutcase. Yeah. That's the one who's saying it? I, That's the one we're supposed to I take guess. seriously and say, okay, it must be true because he said it? I also have not seen them say it. There's I mean, plenty of evidence, but I can't tell you what it is. <clears throat> right. So, uh, not you said know, that you have all this stuff this. going on to try to distract uh, when, in fact, uh, you know, uh, maybe they're going to claim that in two weeks. If cases go up, it must be because that Chinese uh, uh, they keep putting lab it in. somehow or other snuck right. in again. Look under your bed. Look in the closet. Walmart. It's time we did something about it, says Stephen Miller. Okay. Well, all right. We'll see how they deal with it in two weeks if we even remember. I mean, they could just change their story we'll again. I mean, we will. That's true. But somehow that doesn't seem to to make a dent in the reporting in some way. Occasionally you see him, uh, videos circulating of Trump uh, denying that he said something that day or the day before. So I suppose they could always just go that route. But uh, – yeah, and, and and as far as the where the the origin of the virus, it seems to me, that, I mean, my initial guess would be that the Florida, Fl- Florida would have been seeded by New Yorkers and people from the tri-state area. I would right. guess. Right. I mean, there may be more than one right. thing going on. So, also, versus beaches, indoor versus industry. outdoor. I mean, a whole bunch of stuff might yeah. be happening. I guess that's true. Uh, my guess is the, the yeah that the the East Coast got it the same way and. Uh, that the meat packing plants are, are are closer to the west and probably got it from that direction, but but the meat packing plants, huh. from an environmental point of view, might be yeah. closer to subways than beaches. Yeah, you know? right. So uh, yeah, it could be that the virus, uh, the, the source, maybe isn't as important as how it gets transmitted and in what atmosphere you're working and living. Yeah. So again, we just to out. just to I point out, uh, nobody should be declaring out. that they know this stuff. There's a lot we don't know, I and know, it's pretty complicated. Right? So. Uh, the idea no, that you should, no. okay, well, we don't know, therefore we can do anything we want, is really oh. stupid. Well, that's true. <laughs> that seems to be, uh, you know, a spinning out of control. But that, that too, was sort of predictable. I, I, I likened it early on to the, uh, to the rules for arming teachers, where they said, well, we're going to have very strict protocols for everyone's safety, which makes everybody feel better about it. And here they, we're going to have very strict rules for reopening and we're only going to do it safely. Ah, I feel good about that. And then break all the rules and then say, bah. but you don't want to, you don't want to disarm those teachers, do you? And, and leave everybody freedom. defenseless. Right. And, and now you don't want to go back, do you? So, mm. you know, they're not going to close restaurants that uh, seat at more than 50% capacity. They're not going to close areas that people refuse to social distance i still am finding myself uh going to the grocery store with a sign up that says you have to have a mask on to come in here and i go in eh, that's weird people in here don't have masks how did they get in you know they're just going to be like they're going to put that sign up and then they say well am i going to say no to your money come on in you know it's it's an interesting proposition and i'm not a lawyer and i don't play one on tv 
But from the politics point of view, even somebody as responsible as Mike DeWine had to back off on mandatory masks for indoor places like grocery stores because people just weren't doing it. And so you could make it advisory, but it's really tough to make mandatory. At the same time, what's the liability in terms of a uh, institution like a gym Mm -hmm. or a grocery store if you decide to frequent that place and then you get sick? Yeah. I mean, either uh, one place that uh, on national news was talking about opening was a gym in Georgia who was uh, the fellow was talking about having these indemnity things signed. You know, it's not my fault yeah. if you get sick right. before you are allowed to be there. But do you do that when you shop? Are there signs on the doors of these institutions like malls that are opening that mm-hmm. say if you come to the mall, we're not responsible. You have to sign something that says that you agree before you come in. I mean, how does that work? So uh, it it, it's complicated, and uh, you know, just uh, let's just say not well thought out at the moment. No, uh, some of the states think that they are the legislatures think that they are passing or have passed or will pass a blanket indemnity of sorts. Well, you can't. Do, we're not going to allow uh, actions to lie against the store if you go in there and you get sick. But, but then you know, you know but like then you get back, up, then you get back yeah, to the Senate. You know, maybe, oh, we don't really want to do anything that's going to help people. What we want is yeah. we want to make sure that large corporations get these indemnity mm-hmm. uh, protections, just like we did for people who make guns. And at the same time, we certainly don't want you to actually get money to people who need it. Yeah, it could come out that way. Uh, of course, also, you could put up those signs and you could pass a thing in the legislature. And just like... Uh, we were saying here, we, we, we have a mask policy. Yeah, well, we're going to violate the mask policy. Well, we have an indemnity policy. You can't sue your employer or a store that you shop at if you get sick. Well, you know what? A suit got filed, and now uh, court says, yeah, that, that was never really true. Uh, well, I'm going to have to play it out and find out. Who knows when right. these things are true. And, uh, but I, and, and all I'm just saying it's big corporations. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> We'll uh, have it hold, and then small mom and pop, the backbone of America. The, the ones the who can't afford to stable the lawyers. Yeah. For the them, ones who can't afford to stable the lawyers to apply for PPP protection. Right. Uh, That's and, not uh, protection from public policy yeah. polling. <laughs> That's to get their money for the uh, payroll protection plan. Yes. And uh, that's not working either. Surprisingly enough, and uh, pew, pew, pew. to no one's to no one's surprise. To no one's surprise. All right, I'm going to finish my segment All with right. just a quick uh, reference to an article here, All right. which I just thoroughly enjoyed by David Ewing Duncan in Vanity Fair. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Why didn't the world listen to the coronavirus, Cassandras? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That sounds familiar. Okay. People like Larry thing. Brilliant, Bill and Melinda Gates, really? the World Health Organization, been shouting that? about the current pandemic disease acts near constantly for a couple of decades. Me in the background raising my hand. Right. And but talk and action are weeks. different planets. Okay. Would-be prophets professing to know the future are continuing to pop up as the pandemic rages. For instance, Larry Brilliant says the duration. He's an epidemiologist, by the way. And brilliant. And, uh, former, uh, uh, former band That's doctor to the Grateful right? Dead. Says the duration. That's true, by the way. Says the oh. duration of the contagion depends on how quickly we can test everybody and stop the spread. One expert said it could last up to 24 months if the virus follows the usual pattern of receding and returning. And he mentions cool. a whole bunch of people, not only Larry Billion, but Mike Osterholm, uh, Lori Garrett. Uh, it's an interesting group of people, uh, oh, many genius. of whom I worked with back in the 2007s, 2008s, 2009s on the uh, H1N1 uh, pandemic and it's true at the time you actually had businesses paying uh these folks to set up conferences that they could go lecture in order to try and prepare for stuff and that's why there's so much that's sitting there that they could quote take off the shelf end quote ah. that's when they put it on the shelf uh and it's just interesting reading them and, and you know so what happens when you tell people to do that and you don't listen well this oh well, this is what we're doing right now. Okay, what do you do next? Okay, and then they were asking, okay, you guys, you saw it coming. Now, what do we do? And basically, uh, you know, as they say, as predictions pile up, we now know over the past decade and a half, we failed to listen to numerous warnings, which raises another question who are the Cassandras of the moment, Mm. and what would it take for us to listen to them? Mm. You're never going to listen. That's why it's Cassandra. Yeah, I guess. I mean, even naming yourself Larry Brilliant didn't seem to work. Yeah, I can't figure that out. I'm a job, you know, Frank expert on exactly this thing. 
Oh, well, I'm not going to listen to you. We could name yourself Cassandra, see if it works. But, uh, so, you know, they, they, they had different approaches to the thing. Mike Osterholm's conferences were very much uh, aimed at having businesses come in, the utilities, hmm. uh, uh, you know, the electricians uh, and line men uh, companies, uh, you know, uh, those who uh, move, uh, you know, if a corporation uh, executive moves from one place to another, there's a company that does that. And so these worldwide companies that or uh, within the United States, uh, lots of movement because the utility uh, folks can go from Ohio to Connecticut to rebuild a uh, power see. grid in, in a heartbeat if something happens, which mm. we know from when it happened. Uh, so it was aimed at businesses who were in the process of uh, uh, having reach beyond your own individual county. I and see. the Larry Brilliant uh conferences were much more academic, uh, off the record from WHO and the dean from this medical school or, uh, you know, this particular uh, academic uh, epidemiologist who uh, has a different way of approaching this. Uh, I went to both. So I have an idea of the differences between them. Yeah. And uh, it was just interesting because the different uh, ideas and how you go about doing this is a story in and of itself, but it's a, it's a nice read about the Cassandras and how they worked and what they're doing and whether or not you should listen to them now. Okay. Well, I uh, will take a look at that one. It, it seems remarkable now thinking back on it and seeing that he does a TED talk and everything, all those people sitting in that audience together and no masks or anything. It sounds, it seems, it wasn't back in, back in the day when you could do that thing, which was really never true. It's just that, uh, we were, uh, better prepared uh, to our immune systems to fight off what we were passing around then. So we're right. doing the well, same thing. You should always be washing your hands, and I guess we'll never get away from that. All right. Well, thanks very much. We'll comb over that one as well. Larry, brilliant. I really want, I should be taking a cue from that. Change the name of the show. Right. Okay. David Broadcaster will be back with you <laughs> in just a moment. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, Greg. And we'll check in with you on Wednesday, by which time we'll probably be Mad Max Thunderdoming it. And uh, see what happens. Okay. Appreciate your time today. Thanks. We'll talk David to you Broadcaster then. and Greg Cassandra will be back in a minute. Okay, brilliant. Welcome back to the KGO in the Morning Show here on At Roots Radio. Just opening up a few other things that we might want to discuss. Uh, let's see. What can we add to all of this? Uh, all right. Well, uh, some of the things that uh, I want to address. Well, one I, I, I will address even though I don't have a full answer here, but I did happen to get a note from Linda, a listener and supporter of the show on Patreon, and we thank you very much for doing that and remind everybody that they should be heading over there, and uh, if you haven't uh, figured out a way to spend all of your awesome stimulus check from Donald Trump or something, in all likelihood, though, if you if you have it in hand, you've probably figured out exactly what you want to do with it, but uh, if you can't figure anything out, you can always send it to us. We'll take it, and... Uh, Use it to buy fruits and vegetables and uh, whatever, you know, why not? Give it a shot, right? You know, it's not, not really a great time to be asking people, uh, hey, uh, in, the, in these uncertain times. Although that reminds me, I do want, I need to update the, uh, the break and the advertisement that we uh, do during the uh, podcasts to remind everybody that, yes, if you can, you should, in fact, be supporting the show and maybe Patreon is the way you want to do it. Just keep us up and operating so that we can, to the extent this is true, keep you sane during these crazy times. And uh, now that you're stuck at home, perhaps you have even more time to listen to such podcasts and support them as well. But uh, yeah, uh, it occurs to me that I, I should now uh, update the piece, update these ads. And of course, you know, in the, the sign of the times, say, in these uncertain times, as everyone else is doing in all of their advertising. But then that would date it just as badly as anything else I've done. And one, if there's one thing I've learned from pre-recording those things, it's that I can't help but make it relevant to the moment in which I record it, but then it becomes obviously dated after a certain period of time. And every day I think about updating the things, and every day I think, let's just get the damn podcast produced and put it out there. People want to hear it, and they don't really care. They probably skip the commercials anyway if they're smart. So, uh, you know, uh, don't put any time into it. Now, these days, of course, the time that I used to use to force myself to produce a new ad is now uh, – well, it used to be when no one was home. 
And now everybody's home, and so there's not very rarely a quiet moment in which to do it. Anyway, Linda asks me, remember Linda? Yes. She asks, David, could you explain what Nancy Pelosi is talking about when she says that there are constitutional problems with setting up remote debate and voting? And I can't. So that's the answer. Um, it's not that... It's not that it can't be done. It's that um, it's uh, Nancy Pelosi isn't really uh, explaining it. She's not discussing it. And I don't know whether that's because she's holding the cards close to the vest or it's not really a constitutional problem or some people think it is, but it might not be. I think that's probably the, the most, the closest we can get to a, a, a a correct answer is that nobody's really 100% certain whether or not there would be constitutional problems, which, you know, if you're dealing with the Constitution, is a problem. You now have a constitutional problem. If you can't tell whether or not you actually have one, you have to kind of assume that you do. Otherwise, you know, things that you legislate or do as a legislative body could be rendered invalid later on. And uh, when they're as important as they are now and bailing people out of an incredible life-threatening nation-threatening world-threatening crisis you want to make sure that all the the t's are crossed and i's are dotted and not that they're not making mistakes along the way as we're finding out in some of the hasty or hastily prepared and rushed legislation that has all sorts of unintended consequences that they've turned out in response to the pandemic already but i assume generally speaking, uh, that she's running into constitutional problems. I think, you know, there are some constitutional dictates about when and where uh, the Congress will meet. And so if you run into that and then you say, well, or you read that and you just say, well, you know what, we'll meet somewhere else. Uh, it's not that easy to do necessarily and not all that easy to get around. And certainly, obviously, the Constitution will not have contemplated remote voting or remote debates, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you, you're certainly going to have that to deal with. I'm sure that as people go over, you know, comb over the requirements of the Constitution line by line to see whether or not uh, remote uh, debate and or voting is possible, uh, you know, you run into things where you're just going to say, all right, well, we're clearly going to have to address this. And you write memos and all we can, all we know from Nancy Pelosi is, look, I'm getting memos and they say this could pose a problem. What kind of problem? Constitutional problems. She's not also she's not particularly uh, prone to try to explain those things either. Um, you know, it, it doesn't do anybody any good in terms of. I think she recognizes pretty well what the audience really is. You and I want to know, and then the other, you know, 380 million people or whatever uh, don't don't care or wouldn't understand it if you told them. And it might not even be true. So, you know, it's kind of odd uh, and maybe not the best use of her time. Although, really, it would be great if, for instance, they could release a CRS report, for instance, that might have raised these problems. And maybe they have, and just people aren't passing them around. Uh, just sort of curious. I mean, I, I can think off the bat, for instance, of, um, well, for instance, uh, there are quorum requirements for conducting business. And I guess there's an initial question, you know, does does a large number of people on a Zoom conference constitute a quorum, even if it's the majority of, you know, the Constitution is a majority of the House constitutes a quorum. Uh, okay. Um, well, you know, does a majority of the House, if they're not in the same place, constitute a quorum? Does gathering them on Zoom really constitute a quorum or not? It might be as, as fundamental as, as that. Then, of course, um, other questions like, you know, verifying the identity of the people on the Zoom conference. And I guess you could work. That's, a, I guess, an IT security question, which also likewise not contemplated by the Constitution. But even if you can settle on 
the identity of the people in the Zoom conference, it's difficult to to guess what a court, particularly this Supreme Court, if they want to screw around with things, is going to say about gathering people in Zoom and whether or not uh, they're in fact present and uh, whether uh, a gathering remotely counts as session versus recess or adjournment. And, the, you know, there's a lot of fundamental questions to be asked and answered about this stuff. And, you know, not much else. Uh, here's something else I wasn't really thinking of, but as I'm sort of skimming through, uh, what, you want to do this this way? I mean, we can spend a few minutes on it. Like, here's here's the Constitution, and I'll read it to you, and I don't think, we'll start right at the beginning, Article 1, and I don't think Section 1 has anything uh, to implicate here. Uh, all legislative power is granted, uh, vested in Congress, which will consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. So far, so good, unless you raise the fundamental question of, you know, is a Zoom meeting the House of Representatives or the Senate? Uh, it, it isn't, but, you know, uh, you can see right away we have problems. And, and, and if it all depends on what five justices say in the end uh, and which justices say it, who knows? I mean, that's uh, it's hard to define, but is that a constitutional problem? It, it is until you answer it. Section two, uh, the House shall be composed of members chosen every second year. No problem with that, I don't think. Um, the original deal about the senators, which they later changed about how they get chosen. Um, hmm, nothing much else in section two that poses a real problem, I don't think. Senate Section three, uh, the Senate, how they're chosen. That got changed, of course. It's no longer the state legislatures. We directly elect them. Section four. The times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives. Okay, we haven't gotten to that yet, but now if it's... Uh, uh, although this, I guess, makes it easier to contemplate voting by mail, right? The times, places, and manners of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. So if they say we're going to vote by mail, that should be enough. But Congress may at any time, by law make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing senators so okay well now how about this the congress shall assemble at least once in every year when they i mean we have assembled in this year so we're taken care of but if i guess you're going remote forever for instance are they assembling Is zoom assembling for the purposes of the constitution yes no i don't know uh, section five, uh, each house shall be the judge of the elections, returns, qualifications, a majority of each shall constitute a quorum to do business, but a smaller member number may uh, adjourn from day to day, et cetera. Et cetera. But the, right there, the quorum requirement that we mentioned, uh, is being on zoom, the same as being on the floor together for purposes of constituting a quorum. Well, it could be because of course, Section 5 is also the one that tells us that each house may determine the rules of its proceedings. So they certainly could say, well, by majority vote, uh, adopt a new rule that says, yeah, well, being together on Zoom is a is a quorum. Uh, each house shall keep a journal of its proceedings. That's not necessarily an issue. You can hit the record button on Zoom, for instance. Um, mm -hmm, uh, oh, this is a, the yeas and nays of the members of either house on any question shall at the desire of one fifth of those present be entered on the journal. And uh, I guess that's another question too, right? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of uh, entering that on the journal was one fifth of the house uh, say it's okay. Uh, go ahead and register your votes. I don't know. This, this one here has an away from the keyboard notice up. Is that, uh, are they present or are they not present? I'm not sure. Anyway, you get the idea. They could be just about anything. Section six is about compensation uh, for serving in the House or Senate. Mm, section seven, all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives, not on Zoom. I think it actually says that right in the Constitution. Mm, uh, the present, you know, presentment clause, you know, uh, is in there. Uh, and let's see, section eight. Lay and collect taxes, duties, uh, borrow money, regulate commerce. That doesn't seem to be an issue with remote voting. 
Uh, section 9, also, nothing that couldn't be done remotely necessarily. Section 10, about states entering into treaties and alliances. Uh, letters of mark and reprisal. Uh, I wasn't expecting to discuss that, but that's in Section 10, by the way. Is, that, uh, is there any... Um, is, is, are they working without letters of mark and reprisal in Project Airbridge when they're stealing PPE overseas, either from other countries or from the various states or localities? I don't know. That's sort of a different uh, issue. Article 2, of course, has to do with the president. So all the way through, our, there's a couple places. You see the problem? It basically, we have to wait to find out uh, and or guess at whether or not courts are going to say that this is a realistic interpretation of the Constitution given the circumstances, and it could be a crazy decision that they come up with. It wasn't that long ago that the Supreme Court, both of Wisconsin and the United States, said, yeah, everybody should go out and vote in Wisconsin. That's what the Constitution says people should do. And uh, even though there's nothing in the Constitution that says you can't vote by mail, uh, if the state legislature hasn't said that they will, then they shouldn't and and or can't, and everybody has to go out there and get coronavirus instead. Uh, last report was uh, last week. We learned that something like 57 cases in Milwaukee were traced to having to show up to live vote that day. Uh, they just decided that, so they may very well decide, yeah, being on Zoom at the same time just isn't a quorum. Uh, and then, of course, there's the security issues, which I think everybody else was anticipating. So that's my guess. Uh, you know, the problem is I can't really tell you what Nancy Pelosi is talking about in particular because I don't know what's most important to her and what she's been presented with. But maybe we'll find out shortly. Uh, maybe something I can do is uh, poke around to see. Maybe there is a CRS report that's public now that explains it. Nancy Pelosi could have said at a press conference. If you would like to understand these issues more closely, I recommend CRS report number XYZ entitled whatever it is, and then we would all go look it up. But uh, I assume she was asked another question very uh, close on the heels of that one and moved on. All right. Just thought I would bring that up uh, because it is a good question, and I'd like to know, and I'm sure you would too, and maybe someday soon we will. But that's our best guess at it without finding the CRS reports. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's a report from Yahoo News, which is, always makes me feel comfortable having to say that my source is Yahoo, but okay. Uh, Kristen Myers, writing for Yahoo Finance, I guess puts everything you need to know in the headline. Reopening states will cause 233,000 more people to die from coronavirus, according to a Wharton model. I don't know if you still believe in Wharton, because they, of course, said that Donald Trump understood uh, finance enough to graduate from the place. And uh, maybe they're not credible anymore. But uh, yeah, 233,000, of course, that would, of, of course, exceed the number that uh, the administration is clinging to as uh, good job numbers. Um, uh, we know we, we've, we've made light of uh, Trump pegging the number at, I never saw him peg it at 50,000 day, but I remember him saying, oh, about 60,000 and then upping it to 67,000 when we were approaching 60, uh, though, again, that only bought us like four days. And then once it started coming up above 60, he said, well, really, it might be 70. And then we're going to hit 70 today. And uh, well, maybe now he says 80, which I don't think he's getting the point about how quickly this grows. Uh, but I do remember that at one point he said anything under 100,000 would be a good job. We've done a great cut because we were told that it could be 1 million or even 2 million people. And then he even hedged that and said, well, so anywhere between 100 and 200,000 is, is a good number. You've done a good job if one to 200,000 people die, but we hope it'll be even less than that. Well, Yahoo says that uh, Wharton says that reopening the states, which we're doing now, will cause 233,000 more people to die on top of the 70,000 we're already at. That would bring us to 300,000, and that would be a bad job. But then, of course, they would wiggle out of that by saying, well, we said 100 to 200,000 people could die if we have good, strong mitigation measures in place and keep them there. And we didn't keep them. 
although why then we didn't keep them would be a question for the people who said that it would help. Uh, it's weird that the president is then tweeting out messages of support for protesters against those mitigation methods that were going to keep us under 200,000. But, you know, that would be, oh, I don't understand why President Trump isn't being logical and consistent and doesn't understand what he's doing. Okay, you know, we've been over that. Anyway, um, yeah, also, as I mentioned uh, earlier, they're just going to be breaking the rules all over the place. Eli Pariser, I see, tweeting today uh, from a Vox article, another Vox explainer. Is it the same one? I don't think so. This piece, uh, the article he's tweeting, Aaron Rupar, who's uh, gained fame on Twitter for tweeting around uh, pithy little uh, video takes of our stupid president doing stupid things. But here on the written side, U.S. coronavirus data is at odds with Trump's push to get the economy back up and running. Eli's quote that he pulls out of there is, not a single state has met a key reopening criterion identified by the White House Coronavirus Task Force, a steady 14-day decline in new cases. That, so that's the bottom line of the rules we're going to be violating and how clear it is that we're going to be violating them left and right, just like with the armed teachers, the rule from the administration, as though anyone were listening to it. If we had a national response of any kind, I suppose, on any subject, we might have paid more attention to this. But the, the national guideline, if you've got a steady 14-day decline in new cases, I don't know whether they meant nationally or in each individual state, I don't really think it makes any particular difference about which one you're looking at, although uh, that would make certain states maybe would then itch for opening sooner, but it doesn't really matter. In, in other words... If that's the criterion, no one has met that, and yet states are opening. And so you say, but I thought you said that they couldn't open until there was a steady 14-day decline in new cases. Yeah, well, uh, you could say either way. We said that, but uh, to hell with that. Or, you know, if you're Trump, you just say, I never said that. Nobody ever said that. I deny that that was ever said. You play back the tape of him saying it, and he says, but I didn't. And then the reporters say, oh, I don't know what to do with that. He says he didn't. He did, but he says he didn't, and now I don't know what to do. And that's all it is. Now, let me see what Aaron Rupar's uh, for the fuller piece says. Uh, don't be fooled. Despite Trump's reopening hype, new coronavirus cases are on the rise, which, you know, that's the truth, but uh, people wanted to open instead, and so they run around saying that they're not on the rise. And, but they are. Now what? What are you going to do? There's no rule. There's no automatic, there's no self-executing anything that shuts everything back down again. On Sunday evening, Fox News is hosting an America Together returning to work virtual town hall with President Donald Trump. <clears throat> so he even titled it Returning to Work. Uh, capping off a weekend that the, the president's been to Camp David uh, and no indication that he tried to escape Camp David to go play golf either, as some of us predicted. Uh, let's see. So he spent the weekend at Camp David to reportedly convene talks about reopening the economy and post a lot of tweets. He wasn't very busy with any of the meetings. You know, uh, some of the articles I read over the weekend uh, indicate that he <clears throat> he typically does skip the, almost all the meetings of his coronavirus task force and has either uh, Jared Kushner or uh, sometimes Ivanka sit in for him, occasionally some other people. Uh, who might actually be better versed in these things, but he doesn't go to them, and he watches TV and tweets instead. But, uh, you know, that's what he spent the weekend on, uh, not attending his own conferences on reopening the economy. So at this town hall event, uh, well, this, I guess, was written before it went off, Trump is likely to continue working to convince Americans that the worst of the coronavirus pandemic is already in the rearview mirror. He has consistently done so, recently encouraging protesters, agitating against stay-at-home orders, and saying last week, I'm very much in favor of what they're doing, referring to governors moving on uh, reopening businesses. He's declared, we're opening our country again, and proclaimed the country will be ready for any second wave of coronavirus that might arise in fall or winter. 
except that we're not done with the first wave. That's really the point. Not a single state, as they point out here, has met a key reopening criterion identified by the White House Coronavirus Task Force, which he wasn't paying attention to to begin with, a steady 14-day decline in new cases. So not Texas, which reopened, not Georgia, which reopened, not South Dakota, which never closed, whatever. In fact, when hardest-hit New York State is taken out of the equation, the national trajectory of new daily coronavirus cases currently shows an upward trend. The only state that could or should be talking about reopening, I guess, then, is New York, which has had a steady decline in new cases. I don't know if it's been all 14 days in a row or not, uh, and it may not have declined to the point where they feel safe uh, reopening, but, well, you know, there it is. Uh, and the article goes on to share some of the more widely shared and famous graphs, the Financial Times death graph, as they call it here, uh, shows pretty clearly that the U.S. is plateauing, not falling. There are lots of countries where you can see the curve heading downward, and it's just not happening in the U.S. I'm glad we're plateauing, but that wasn't the deal. 14 days of decline, and there have been zero. So if you want to know how far they'll deviate from the rules in order to get what they want, the answer is uh, they'll deviate from all of them. There are no rules to which you can hold these guys. All right. Let's see. Um, uh, I do have some news anyway about what they're doing with some of these protesters. If you saw any footage or still photos Of what was going on, you were likely appalled, of course, by the lack of masks and social distancing, but even more appalled, I'm sure, uh, by a lot of the video of the confrontations and the the close proximity between the protesters and the police um, at these protests. And uh, you must have been wondering, uh, how is it that all of these white protester people are able to shove police, get in their face, scream, spit on them, throw things at them, and not get arrested. And, well, I think we all know the answer to that one. And that was rather dismaying. But at least in California, uh, we have the news that 32 of the protesters were, in fact, arrested, according to California Highway Patrol uh, data. So, you know, we at least have that to point to. Maybe they didn't get all of the worst people that were revealed on video. I don't know. But at least some people are, in fact, being arrested for this stuff. And uh, I guess that's, you know, that's the best you can do. That's the best news you can get out of this stuff. By the way, a lot of American flags brought to that protest by the uh, Californians who were out getting themselves in trouble and uh, dropped on the ground and trampled which ordinarily gets you in trouble with the Patriot crowd, except that the Patriot crowd, so-called Patriot crowd, was the one doing the protesting in this case, so never mind. All right, let's see. Uh, A couple other things we can, uh, I can envision for our final segment, but uh, our break is coming up, so we'll probably uh, just do a short hit here and there and then move on to the longer stories afterwards. Um, Did happen to notice, update uh, for... Listeners who've been with us through the uh, duration of the coronavirus pandemic emergency. Um, One, my biggest disappointment in all of this was, of course, finding out that the name of Ohio's chief medical officer was not Dr. Amy Action, as uh, The Hill reported it to be, but rather Dr. Amy Acton, the much less exciting last name, Acton. But to, to me, she's always Dr. Action. Anyway, here's something of some interest. As you know, uh, the protests in California, easy for Republicans to organize because the governor of California is a Democrat. Uh, Protests in New York beginning at long last. uh, Can't wait for those. Uh, Those those finally materialize. It took a while to materialize in New York because they were so hard hit. But they finally managed to convince some people to come out, Republicans to come out and protest against Andrew Cuomo. Um, They've happened elsewhere in, uh, where have we seen them? In, uh, in, in Michigan, of course, most famously, uh, where Governor Whitmer is a Democrat. But in Ohio, where lots of the Trumpy types of people actually live, 
the governor is Republican. And so they had some difficulty, I guess, uh, walking that tightrope. How do we organize uh, Republicans to protest against a Republican governor where he's been very forward and strong in uh, Trump terms uh, in maintaining his stay at home orders? And the answer is, ah, we can go protest Dr. Action, who is not a Republican and may actually even be a Democrat. But when we first learned about her, uh, had been hired despite partisan differences with Mike DeWine. And it was a very impressive thing. So guess what? They found out where she lived and they're protesting at her house. They found a woman and a Democrat that they can do this to. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I've been looking back at the uh, archived articles to see if I could find any proof that uh, Dr. Action really was a Democrat, or maybe I was just misremembering that. I guess probably, in all likelihood, she was uh, apolitical. Whether she voted for Democrats or not is another question, but in all likelihood, she was apolitical in her public stances. That's probably how she got to be the uh, top uh, public health officer there in the first place um but uh you know we probably uh, we we made a logical leap probably from the fact that she was science driven and reality driven that she probably voted for democrats but maybe she didn't anyway and i don't see any proof anywhere in my initial skimming of the articles that i was able to turn up that she says yeah i vote for democrats all the time but hey here i am at the top of uh, Ohio's uh, uh, public health uh, apparatus. At any rate, what was really more important here was that they found someone that they could blame who wasn't on Team Republican, which I guess reveals all you really need to know about the way these protests have been organized and by whom they've been organized. They absolutely um, every other state they where they have the protests, they are protesting at the state house or occasionally at the governor's mansion or nearby, and they are directing their ire at the governor. Ohio, I don't think it's difficult to find out where the governor is or where the seat of the legislature is. Uh, it would, in fact, probably be more difficult to find out the uh, where uh, Dr. Acton's personal residence is, but they found out, all right, and... Uh, Let's see, I have the tweets from a photographer who witnessed the protest and took some pictures of it. Uh, K.R. Forbes Photography. You'll find uh, them on Twitter as K.R. Forbes Photo. And uh, let me see if I can click in here and get some understanding of who is who's K.R. Forbes. Uh, maybe you'll find it on our Facebook page. It looks like... It's not here exactly, but at any rate, uh, it was portrayed here. A small group of protesters have gathered in front of the central Ohio home of Dr. Amy Acton. Neighbors report several men walking up and down the street with assault weapons, stating that there will be no violence, quote, for now. Hmm. Uh, so the bikers uh, here, some regular-ish looking normal people, protesters, but still spending their day marching back and forth in front of the house of Ohio's top public health officer. And then I don't see the guns in the pictures, but I guess uh, there are maybe more pictures elsewhere. But yep, once again, just lots of fun. They found a woman to blame and somebody that they could protest who wasn't the Republican governor. So they're not just nonpartisan, independent folks who just want to redress grievances with their governing 
uh, authorities, they are, I think it's pretty obvious, uh, Republican operatives and motivated by um, by partisan uh, what? Motivated, well, I was going to say motivated by partisan motivations, but well, okay. I think that will serve to tell you what's going on here, even if I didn't do it as eloquently as I could have. Anyway, let's see. Let me go back to the rest of what's in pocket and share some other stuff with you. Uh, there was, I guess, the most infuriating of the articles over the weekend would probably be, or the you know, astonishing, infuriating, what have you, would have been the Washington Post's very splashy 34 days of pandemic, which I was a little upset with that in the uh, title here. I get they're talking about a critical period that happened to have lasted 34 days, 34 days of a pandemic inside Trump's desperate attempts to reopen America. But I was upset because at the same time that some of these states were reopening and saying, well, the pandemic is over because something not sure exactly what I got fewer people dying in New York, therefore pandemic over. Um, and then to have this 34 days of pandemic made it sound like, well, that's how long the pandemic lasts. It's, it's over now. We're past the 34 days and everyone can go open their states now. Uh, so it, it came out. Uh, and I guess what was really infuriating about that was that was actually an in-depth look at uh, how the White House was operating and how many, again, how many signals of uh, the worsening of the situation they ignored both before it broke out widely in the United States and afterwards, and just all the errors they continue to make. It's just very bad news, but uh, also a long read. And perhaps you spent part of your weekend uh, looking at it already. Uh, there's also an accompaniment to this. Um, lots of tweeting around of the way... Uh, the curves are moving in other countries where there are sharp downturns and they may be ready to reopen and ours is just not turning down at all. There's a piece in The Atlantic by Ann Applebaum uh, who writes, the rest of the world is laughing at Trump, which is a little difficult to take because of how poorly we're doing with the pandemic in this country and how many people are dying and it's bad news that the rest of the world is laughing at us. But I guess the the real takeaway from this thing are some passages about three quarters of the way through in which uh, uh, Applebaum observes that there are um, diplomats with decades of experience all over the world who are remarking for the record, either just for this article or elsewhere, uh, that the thing that has surprised them most about the situation is that the United States for the first time in a global situation, you know, the United States is just completely invisible in terms of leadership. We're invisible as the victims of this thing or visible enough as the victims of the world's leading. Uh, the, we're basically the home of the coronavirus at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, the, I guess what was most, interesting about this profile was the number of people saying there hasn't been a situation that was international in any sense, whether it's, you know, even if it's localized, an earthquake, a tsunami happened somewhere, a civil war breaks out even in a, 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 a political backwater that Americans aren't usually used to, accustomed to paying attention to. America's involved. America is always been there, you know, doesn't solve every single problem, certainly, but the world always knows that the Americans are going to weigh in on this thing for better or for worse. And this is the first time in anybody's memory that America has just been absent completely from offering any sorts of solution. They meddled in things and said, for instance, the G7 can't put out a statement about uh, what happened unless we call it the Wuhan virus. So the whole effort collapses. But, uh, you know, extremely important point. And, and a, another important point, I guess, well, let's just jump into it a little bit to set the table for this point. Maybe we, we can get to it quickly, but you know how Ann Applebaum works. So it's a very illustrative uh, opening here. 
uh, that doesn't get right to the nitty gritty, let's say, but it's an important point for later. It looks at first, it begins, like one of a zillion unfunny video clips that now circulate on the Internet. Once Upon a Virus features cheap animation, cheesy music, and sarcastic dialogue between China, represented by a Lego terracotta warrior with a low masculine voice, and the United States, represented by a Lego Statue of Liberty with a high squeaky voice. They speak in short sentences. We discovered a new virus, says the warrior. So what, says the Statue of Liberty. I don't know how squeaky the voice really is. It's dangerous, says the warrior. It's only a flu, says the Statue of Liberty. Wear a mask, says the warrior. Don't wear a mask, says the Statue of Liberty. Stay at home, says the warrior. It's violating human rights, says the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the dialogue goes on like that. It will go away in April, the Statue of Liberty says at one point, until it ends, finally, with the statue on an intravenous drip, making wild and contradictory statements while the warrior jeers at her. Although this looks like an I'm bored at home amateur production, it is not. The video was published on April 30th by Xinhua, the official Chinese news agency. It has since been promoted by Chinese diplomats and watched, as of yesterday afternoon, by more than 1.6 million people around the world. It has also been mocked and denounced as crude propaganda, which, of course, it is. Crude propaganda is what Chinese leaders do. Or I should say, as what China's leaders do, both at home and abroad. And since the pandemic began, they have stepped up their efforts. But even those who are mocking should be aware. Anybody who knows any history will be aware that propaganda, even the most obvious, most shameless propaganda, sometimes works. And it works not because people necessarily believe that all of it is true, but because they respect the capabilities or fear the power of the people who produced it. Seems like kind of a bigger point than is absolutely necessary for it, but... It becomes important later on. Uh, she goes on to discuss other propaganda and other reactions from around the world, headlines and news pieces from uh, respected sources abroad, basically saying, yeah, Trump is uh, an idiot. I mean, th their reaction, for instance, to his press conferences uh, has been kind of remarkable. And uh, we were kind of jealous of the way they're covering things. And they're actually coming out and saying, yeah, he was a nutcase. And he's speaking nonsense. Anyway, um, the uh, then the point here, but if Trump is ridiculous, his administration is invisible. Carl Bildt, B-I-L-D-T, a Swedish prime minister in the 1990s. I think we've actually spoken his name on the show once or twice before. A United Nations envoy during the Bosnian Wars and a foreign minister for many years after that told me, that looking back on his 30-year career, he cannot remember a single international crisis in which the United States had no global presence at all. Normally, when something happens, a war, an earthquake, everybody waits to see what the Americans are doing, for better or for worse, and then they calibrate their own response based on that. This time, Americans are doing nothing. Or to be more specific, because plenty of American governors, mayors, doctors, scientists, and tech companies are doing things, the White House is doing nothing. There is no presidential leadership inside the United States. There is no American leadership in the world. They talk about the G7 incident and Pompeo insisting on Wuhan virus and the whole thing collapsing. Mm -hmm. And then moving on here, they talk about uh, how it even got even worse with Trump saying that we should inject disinfectant, etc., etc. Then on to this bit here. Look beyond the Lego video at China's more serious public relations campaign. The stunts at airports around the world, from Pakistan to Italy to Israel, designed to mark the arrival of Chinese aid. Masks, surgical gowns, diagnostic tests, sometimes doctors... These events all have a similar script. The plane lands, the receiving nation's dignitaries go out to meet it, the Chinese experts emerge, looking competent in their hazmat gear, and everyone utters words of gratitude and relief. Of course, some of this, too, is propaganda. In reality, some of the equipment 
billed as aid has been purchased, not donated. Some of it, uh, especially the diagnostic tests, have turned out to be defective. Some of those who receive the goods also know perfectly well that they are designed to silence questions about where the virus came from, why knowledge of it was initially suppressed, and why it was allowed to spread around the world. If, in these circumstances, the propaganda works, that's because those who receive it have made a calculation. Pretending to believe, believe it is a way of acknowledging and accepting Chinese power, and perhaps a way of expressing interest in Chinese investment. In the Western world, this dynamic has played itself out with striking success in Italy. Flattened by the virus and depressed by the lockdown, Italians are deeply divided by years of conspiratorial social media campaigns, some with Russian backing, that have attacked Italy's traditional alliances, NATO as well as the European Union. China has added its own unsubtle social media campaign. Bots have been promoting Chinese-Italian friendship hashtags and thank you China hashtags. But there is another less visible layer of activity too. A year ago, Italy became the core European member of the Belt and Road Initiative, the Chinese trade and infrastructure project designed to create deeper links across Eurasia and to provide an alternative to the transatlantic and Pacific trade pacts quashed by Trump. And we've talked about the Belt and Road Initiative in a slightly different context about uh, the way the Chinese uh, will come in and offer a, uh, a poor country or particularly an underdeveloped country uh, to pay for the entire development <clears throat> of modern transportation infrastructure, usually uh, transportation infrastructure that they need in order to export needed raw materials from that country, but then uh, retaining ownership or offering it, uh, offering a, a lease or forcing the country <clears throat> where the project was built to offer a 99-year lease to China <clears throat> such that uh, they control the port that controls the global trade in that countries important natural resource exports which they could at some point if they wanted to use to choke off access to the rest of the world to that important natural resource <clears throat> but uh but it's a greater initiative than that and here it's discussed in a slightly different context foreign minister luigi di maio until recently the leader of italy's anti-eu five-star movement has cultivated links to China, too. Chinese investment has gained importance. Already, a Chinese oligarch has bought the Inter Milan Soccer Club. Chinese banks already own big stakes in Italian companies like uh, ENI, e -I, I don't know actually what that is, <clears throat> and Fiat, which I do know. Thanks to the economic havoc created by the coronavirus, China's efforts in Rome may now bear fruit. Maurizio Molinari, the editor of La Repubblica told me that Chinese businessmen are right now building on their contacts, looking for companies and properties to buy, scouting out factories that are suddenly bankrupt and entrepreneurs who want to sell out. I asked him what the source of China's appeal was right now. Money, he replied. By contrast, the most conspicuous gesture that the U.S. administration has made in Italy's direction since the pandemic began was Trump's abrupt decision to ban flights to cut Italy out of access to the United States. You see? Uh, well, compare the two of those. Which one is going to be viewed more favorably in Italy? <clears throat> Apart from a modest and belated aid package, little in the way of friendship came from the United States. And by the way, uh, I did happen to see uh, one of the stupid lines blurted out by the president last night. Uh, by way of explaining the, the, the outbreaks in Europe, that uh, it was his opinion that the reason Italy had a, a bad bout with coronavirus, in particular, you know, they had been particularly hard hit, was that, well, you see, when I banned Chinese travel to the United States, all the Chinese people who wanted to come to visit the United States said, oh, well, if I can't go to the United States, I'll go to Italy for some reason instead. That's where I'm going to go. And guess what? The virus caught on there, and that's why Italy had a particularly hard time with it. Well, of course, it was pointed out Daniel Dale, I guess, 
had uh, been monitoring this and had felt compelled to point out Italy actually had banned flights from China before the United States did. Uh, and so, you know, that's another problem for Trump saying, I was very early. I was so early banning flights. Nobody else banned flights from China, but I did. I'm so strong. Italy had already done it. And it didn't make a difference, of course. And uh, neither has banning flights from China, which we did ineffectively anyway, uh, made any difference here. We have uh, a million more cases than the uh, Chinese have reportedly had. Who knows whether they're telling the truth. Anyway, back to the story. China's relationships with the Arab world have also deepened during the pandemic. Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait sent aid to Wuhan during the earlier part of the crisis. Later, China reciprocated. The foreign minister of the United Arab Emirates has described China as the role model to follow in this crisis. Hmm. UAE should be, I mean, shouldn't they be cleaving to the United States? Haven't we been coddling them all along? Uh, Haven't we been friendly enough to MBZ, not MBS, but MBZ in the UAE? China is the role model to follow in this crisis. Weird. Uh, Trump's been emphatic that China is not. And yet, there go our allies. On March 8th, Chinese medical workers arrived in Baghdad, an advanced team perhaps poised to take advantage of the inevitable American retreat. In each one of these places, America is absent, distracted, stumbling, and laughable. To be absolutely clear, Applebaum wants you to know, I am not praising China's efforts. I am simply calling attention to the fact that in a world where people laugh at the American president, they might succeed. That is, the Chinese might succeed. Inside the bubble of officials who surround Pompeo, it might well seem very brave and cutting edge to use the expression Wuhan virus or to call for bigger and bolder rhetorical attacks on China. But out there in the real world, out there in the world where Pompeo's boss is perceived as a sinister clown and Pompeo himself as just the sinister clown's lackey, not very many people are listening. Once again, a vacuum has opened up and the Chinese regime is leading the race to fill it. Judging from their own recent statements, Trump administration officials do not yet understand the significance of the chaos they've created in a place or in place of what used to be American foreign policy. Pompeo has spent time in recent days trying to organize sanctions on Iran as if Russia and China or even European allies are still willing to follow his lead. Philip Reeker, Assistant Secretary of State for Europe, or rather Acting Assistant Secretary of State for Europe, because the Trump administration is in a constant state of chaos. Well, he was recently asked by French journalists whether the coronavirus crisis could repair the poor state of transatlantic relations. His pompous response made him sound like a member of the Soviet nomenclatura at the end of the 1980s. I don't agree with the premise of your question, Rieker said, before claiming the transatlantic engagement, and particularly Franco-American cooperation, is remarkable. Yes, it is remarkable, remarkably invisible. Even the more learned analysis of U.S.-China relations suddenly look out of sync with reality. It's all very well for think piece authors or former Trump administration officials to suggest that a post-pandemic America must change its relationships with China, rally its allies to defy China, <clears throat> and rewrite the rules of commerce to exclude China, But when Trump seeks to lead the world against China, who will follow? Italy might refuse outright. The European Union could demur. America's close friends in Asia might feel nervous and delay making decisions. Africans who are furious about racism in China. African students have been the focus of heavy discrimination in the city of Guangzhou. Might well do a quick calculation and seek good relations with both sides. I wish I could say for certain that a President Joe Biden could turn this all around, but by next year it may be too late. The memories of the Prime Minister at the airport welcoming Chinese doctors will remain. The bleach jokes and memes will still cause the occasional chuckle. Whoever replaces Pompeo will have only four short years to repair the damage, and that might not be enough. And if Trump wins a second term, any nation can make a mistake once. 
elect a bad leader once, but if Americans choose Trump again, or even if it gets forced on us, that'll send a clear message. We are no longer a serious nation. We are as ignorant as our thoughtless, narcissistic, ignorant president. Don't be surprised if the rest of the world takes note of that, too. So no surprise there, but uh, well restated. Uh, we're a laughing stock. Of course, the premise of Trump's election campaign was we would be respected again in the world community, and everyone knew that wasn't really going to be the case. But uh, there you have it, some harder proof of what's going on. Uh, from around the world. Let's see, a number of other things that we could be adding, lots of uh, articles over the weekend on the stats about uh, excess deaths, that once again back in the news. Uh, but let me add this one. We'll close with this from the New York Times. I think a relatively short piece might actually even fit here. What the proponents of natural herd immunity don't say. That's interesting, both for our states that say they want to approach things that way uh, and for keeping an eye on what's going on in Sweden. But here's what I guess doesn't get said. Try to reach it without a vaccine and millions will die. Hey, that doesn't seem to be getting said a whole lot. By Dr. Carl T. Bergstrom, a professor of biology at University of Washington, and Dr. Natalie Dean, who's an assistant professor in biostatistics at the University of Florida. Let's see if we can get through this quick. The coronavirus moved so rapidly across the globe, partly because no one had prior immunity to it. Failure to check its spread will result in a catastrophic loss of lives. Yet, some politi politicians, epidemiologists, and commentators are advising that the most practical course of action is to manage infections while allowing so-called herd immunity to build. Now, the concept of herd immunity is typically described in the context of a vaccine. So, interesting to try to think about it without the vaccine. When enough people are vaccinated, a pathogen cannot spread easily through the population. If you are infected with measles, but everyone you interact with has been vaccinated, transmission will be stopped in its tracks. Vaccination levels must stay above a threshold that depends on the transmissibility of the pathogen. We don't yet know exactly how transmissible the coronavirus is. But say each person infects an average of three others. I think it's a little higher than they were originally estimating, but there you have it. Well, of course, that would mean nearly two-thirds of the population would need to be immune in order to confer herd immunity. In the absence of a vaccine, developing immunity to a disease like COVID-19 requires actually being infected with the coronavirus. For this to work, prior infection has to confer immunity against future infection. While hopeful, scientists are not yet certain that this is the case, nor do they know how long this immunity might last. The virus was discovered only a few months ago. But even assuming that immunity is long-lasting, a very large number of people must be infected to reach the herd immunity threshold required. Given that current estimates suggest roughly half a percent to one percent of all infections are fatal, we hope, anyway, that means a lot of deaths. Perhaps most important to understand, the virus doesn't magically disappear when the herd immunity threshold is reached, not with hot weather and not when the herd immunity threshold is reached either. It just doesn't go away. That's not when things stop. That's only when they start to slow down. Uh, like we've described, even if things were to stop growing now, we still have a long downslope to get through in terms of illnesses and death. Once enough immunity has been built in the population, though, each person will infect fewer than one other person, so a new epidemic cannot start afresh. But an epidemic that's already underway will continue to spread. We sometimes seem to leave that out of things. If 100,000 people are infectious at the peak and they infect each of them, infect 0.9 people, that's still 90,000 new infections and more after that. A runaway train doesn't stop the instant the track begins to slope downhill. Obviously not, it would keep going because, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've read it backwards, that's why. A runaway train doesn't stop the instant the track begins to slope uphill, you see. There, that makes more sense. And a rapidly spreading virus doesn't stop right when herd immunity is attained. If the pandemic went uncontrolled in the United States, it could continue for months after herd immunity was reached. 
infecting many more millions in the process. By the time the epidemic ended, a very large proportion of the population would have been infected, far above our expected herd immunity threshold of around two-thirds. These additional infections are what epidemiologists refer to as overshoot. Now, some countries are attempting strategies intended to safely build up population immunity to the coronavirus without a vaccine, like Sweden and uh, <clears throat> others. But many commentators have suggested that this would also perhaps be a good policy for poorer countries like India. But given the fatality rate, there's no way to do this without huge numbers of casualties, as much we knew. And indeed, Sweden has already seen far more deaths than any of its neighbors. We can continue with this subject perhaps tomorrow. Uh, but an interesting point that's made, you don't reach herd immunity and then call it all off. Thousands continue to die even after you hit that peak. Sometimes forgotten. From moments. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The Cake Room in the Morning Show with David Waltman. All right, time now for Justice Putnam to round things up from around the country and around the world in the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. More news about more layoffs at the National Rifle Association. That seems like good news. And overseas news from Israel, where Netanyahu's fate as prime minister rests with Israel's Supreme Court at long last. Let's find out what happens next.